recording in progress. So today uh, we are going to look at not so much programming techniques, but some ideas on, on how to think about user interfaces in finite element codes. And uh, so this is something that we have been doing uh, a couple of years in structural mechanics. So this is uh, partly work from Donnie Locuson as well, um, where we look at how to use interface for exploring forms and structures. So computational tools in architecture engineering. So if you look at the classical simulation cycles of, of the how you use software in finite element code, finite element analysis, is that you usually define your geometry. Uh, you add your forces and boundary conditions, you define your materials, you run the simulation, and you evaluate the results. And if you look at the results, you go back in again and define the geometry. This can be a kind of complicated process with a lot of uh, waiting before you can continue going on. And, uh, so this is something we haven't looked into, see if we can improve this. So a typical example here, this is a, a code called Hopcom, which uh, is used for simulating the hardening of concrete. Uh, so basically when you uh, cast concrete, uh, especially for large structures, uh, it starts generating heat. And it also, uh, and that is prone to cracking. And uh, you need to control this process. So in Harkon, you first you define a geometry like this. Uh, also, you can see this is very two-dimensional model here with just uh, elements um, like this. Then you uh, define your materials like this. Uh, you have concrete. You have uh, some ground materials. This is could could represent a dam, a dam structure. Then you define your boundary conditions that we have uh, a temperature outside, that's 10 degrees. You can also define a varying temperature uh, over time. And then you do time stepping. And this can be a, a long process. You simulate this process over time. And uh, every cycle, it has to do another computation again. And it can be potentially take a long time. But then you get the result. Here. Uh, and at some point, you're perhaps not satisfied with this result. You, you need to go back again and redo the geometry. So you redo the geometry, time step again, and you get new results. But there is a time delay here. So it's often hard to see what effects you have when you change geometry or boundary condition before you have the results. So that could be minutes or hours even between simulations. So there's a lack of feedback between model and visualization. And there is, this discrete computation step interferes with the design process. And it's also often difficult to, to use this approach when you uh, want to discuss design decisions with uh, your customers or a fellow colleague or something. And it's also difficult to see the behavior uh, when you have to wait for results. So if you change something, you have to wait an hour and then you get the result, but it's not kind of obvious what the, what the uh, behavior is. So can we solve this in some way? So let's start by removing the discrete calculation. So how can we do this? So in this example here, let's see if we can have two windows, one window with a, a geometry, another one with results. Um, ideally, you want if you change from the left side, it should change from the right side as well. But still, you still need to do a computation somewhere. So in this case, you get instant feedback when you change something, uh, which also leads to better understanding of, of your model. And it's also encourage you to do uh, explore uh, the science in a, in a much uh, better way. However, there are some problems in this. You still need to do a computation. Uh, but just to go back a bit here, we, have to, we look at uh, some computer theory. So today, computers have a CPU, that is the central processing unit. It's the, the uh, part of the computer that does, actually does the computations. Uh, and 
first you have one task per, so this can execute one task per processor, very simplified. But today many computers have multiple cores or you have multiple CPUs in a single process. So every laptop today, I would say most of them have at least four CPUs, uh, also called cores or Shan of the Svenska, uh, which can execute multiple tasks simultaneously. So you can have multiple uh, computational tasks running at the same time. So you can basically scale your problems uh, four times. So you can actually do four times at the same, four tasks at the same time. So in the classical model here, we, show we, we do modeling, we do computation, we do visualization, we do them in sequential steps. But, so let's do more, more things. So we can do modeling and computation at the same time. We can also do visualization at the same time. So we can have a task in the background that always calculates to, to if, if the, the model is stable, do a calculation, change something, it continuously computes. And you can actually have multiple computational steps as well. So if you have a solver uh, for your computation that is multi-threaded, you can actually increase the speed of the finite element solver at the same time. And if you are using, for example, NumPy, so the NumPy solver can actually run multiple tasks at the same time. So the linear algebra solver in NumPy can use multiple cores to speed up the computation. So already in NumPy there is uh, ways of doing this in parallel. And in, in, the, in the computers we have at Lunar, where I work as well, uh, we actually have every server in, in, the, in, the, in the supercomputer has 20 cores. So you can run 20 tasks at the same time. And the upcoming machine we are building will have 48 cores per server. So you can do 48 computational tasks at the same time. And then you can combine that with that, we will also have 250 servers that you can connect together and do computation. You can do a lot of things in parallel. But if you're looking at the programs here, we are looking at a single computer here. We want to work uh, more interactively. So you have um, some trends we have today. The clock frequencies in computers haven't increased a lot. If you look at the computer you bought three years ago, it probably has the same clock frequency as the computer you have today. So it's somewhere around three, four gigahertz. Um, most laptops have like four, six cores. A computer at home, a stationary computer can have eight, 10 cores. Many of our servers have uh, 12 to 24 cores per processor. And if you have, most servers also have two processors. We have up to 48 cores as standard. Another thing that you have in your computer is the graphics card. And the graphics card is an extremely parallel computer. So, a standard uh, gaming graphics card has like 2,000 cores that can do uh, small trivial tasks very fast in parallel. So it's not the same as a normal processor core that they have in the main CPU. They are small, more specialized, but there's still a resource that you can use uh, for computation. So using these things, you can actually have multi teraflop performance on a workstation hardware and teraflop. Flop is a floating point operation per second, so it should be teraflops. Uh, and, and in mobile hardware today, you, know, you have something like 200, 400 gigaflops per second uh, performance in, in your machine. So, possibilities. So, you could do uh, many complex finite elements that can be actually achieved in real time. Uh, for example, if you have a Equation system you have solved, you can store uh, the factorization of your uh, equation system and just uh, remultiply the force vector all the time. So changing the forces actually doesn't need you to reassemble your, um, your, your uh, stiffness matrix if you have static problems. And you also, if you have multiple, you can actually have applications continuously perform calculations in the background. Uh, and that will enable us to do some. Uh, future generation application where you can actually manipulate the models in real time with computational feedback. And that also uh, involves you can do more, you can have models that you can explore in a different way than having to wait on discrete computational steps. So I will show you some of the things we have been doing here. So one, one thing that, has, that is 
uh, have developed this is the multi touch devices. So, my computer here has multi touch, you have an iPad, your phone has multi touch. And that user interface encourages the users to actually be involved and interact directly with the screen and the model. Uh, so, when you want, when you have a fine element application running on an iPad, you want it to be able to update directly when you push the nodes and calculate immediately uh, that, to take advantage of the user interface. And, and that also that, that user interface were also means that you users feel that you directly manipulate physical objects, which is a very powerful concept. Uh, most mouse-based applications can be adapted for touch as well. So what we do in this case, we have this model, we model geometry. So all the time we have a simulated visualized loop in every step here. So even if you don't have a stable model, it checks if it's stable, it can do some calculations and visualize those. We add force and boundary, we continues to have a simulation visualization loop at all steps so that you can see the effects when you change everything directly. Um, yeah, so this is, Another way of looking at it. This is an example here from an application called Force Path, where we have a force applied to a two-dimensional plate, and then you can update the, the results in real time here and move the force over and see how it affects the, the stress field. We'll show this program live as well later. So it's it's available on the on the Windows App Store. You can download it's called Force Power. So you direct directly with models, direct conceptual modeling. You can uh, have explorable user interfaces, um, and it removes the need to have input devices. You, have, you can have a touchpad device discussing with your customers, the sign change, you just move on the screen and it, it just updates at the model direct. Of course, you need a reasonable good performance in your computer as well to, to support this. We did also a, a large version of Forcepad here in uh, Battenhallen a couple of years ago with a touch, what is called uh, active board or uh, touch sensitive uh, projector screen. Uh, one problem with this user interface that we didn't realize that when you have small children, they can't reach the controls. So we had to, to create a, there's a palette here that is lower down so you can actually access the controls because it's, the user interface is not suitable to have that far up. Um, yeah. So we, we call this a structural whiteboard. So ForgePad is a two-dimensional fine element application, not, not very unsimilar to what you are doing in this course. So if you could do the two-dimensional stress problem, this is what this program does. Um, standard Windows application, test direct manipulation, you can zoom and scroll and you can update the model in real time. It's also based on the concept of a drawing application. So you actually draw with stiffness. So you, you uh, paint, it's a normal paint metaphor. Uh, and then it was translated to finite element model. Um, so this is the final design. I skipped that. I will show that application later instead of doing this one right now. Uh, another application we developed that structure kind of called Objective Frame. Uh, it's a three dimensional. Um, uh, beam application. So you can uh, draw uh, beam like structures in 3D. And we added a uh, special uh, interface here where you can use your hands to manipulate the model. So uh, there is a scanner you place before yourself, before you're on the keyboard, and you recognize your hands. And then you can actually move around and move the the nodes and, and see how the structure uh, can be manip is manipulated in real time. So you can see here there is uh, two green dots here. Those are actually fingers you can 
you can pinch and move around. So you can connect them and you can pull that force and, and move it around. Uh, leaf motion is that device. Uh, and then you, uh, it has a simulation engine that is multi core that does interactive computations all the time. Uh, we have also developed uh, something called uh, Sketch Frame. Uh, and that was a little, uh, started with a, a PhD or a master's thesis work uh, how to implement the finite element application on iPad. Um, uh, to be used as an interactive conceptual tool. Um, so we can use an education, communication, discussion tool. We can also see how, how far we can go, um, how much can an iPad application actually perform in computations, because it's, it has some limitations, at least at the time, in memory and, and processing power. So this application here, you can uh, do two-dimensional um, trusses, uh, with using the fingers, and you can also move the forces, and it will automatically uh, visualize in real time. So there is no simulation button in this application, so it always calculates. So uh, when it's when you have a stable model, it will display uh, um, the. It will display how it will move the mechanisms automatically. If you add a force, it will dis the, the display the, dis the displacements. Um, you can create both beams and bars uh, depending on the node type you select. So it continuously visualizes. Uh, and it bridges gaps with the modeling visualization. Um, and this is, yeah, sorry. This, and, and, uh, have been used and also uh, it was also interesting to see because we tried to do a lot of things in in, um, in sketch frame that was we used the same concept of used with mouse and it didn't work so we actually developed some other additional ways of interacting creating models drawing instead of clicking out nodes and clicking lines between nodes so that was kind of interesting to see that not all the ways we're doing with the normal computer works with an ipad Uh, so, to conclude, we have seen that we can actually limit the discrete calculation step in computation applications to bridge the gap between modeling and visualization. And we can use more of the modern computer architectures. So, take advantage of that we have. Usually, when you see it in Word, the computer is idling, basically. It doesn't wait for your keystrokes and your mouse to move. But we could take advantage of the additional cores that are not used to, 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 to do uh, pre compute things. And, uh, and also the direct manipulation cycle is a great tool to, to create explorative user interfaces. Yeah, we created this, these two applications here. I will just show you here, this is the schedule frame application. Mm. So here you draw with the fingers here, so you don't see the finger here, but basically you draw uh, Create nodes like this. And now that the structure is not stable, so it doesn't compute anything. So you can see here, you just draw with the fingers on the, on the iPad like this. It automatically snaps the nodes. And you set out the boundary conditions. Now I see, as soon as you added a force, it automatically computes the deflection. And you click and then you can pull the force with another finger to change the magnitude of the force. Now you can also see it calculates the, uh, the normal forces of the bars.
and there's no computation. So as soon as you change anything, it displays the results. Now you change the node type from uh, fully uh, rotational but to stiff. So that the squares here are so now there are beams, and then it calculates the uh, moments as well. Get a sketch of frame. So I'm trying to see if I can show you some of the applications live as well. So, this is uh, the objective frame application uh, in the current development version. So, I'm, I'm improving this with new use space. So, here you have a workspace. You can uh, create notes by clicking like this. Then you can no, some C direction here as well. And then you can you can create beams. It has a shadow in the ground to kind of help you out to navigate in 3D as well. And then now it's very simple here. Now we have to actually uh, create some boundary conditions. So we so if we want to fix the rotational position here, we select the bottom nodes. This assign, so now they are locked. And now you can select this uh, tool here, which is a force that you can create, add on uh, any, any position here, and you can see how the structure actually updates in real time. You can have also show the moments here, how it's updating the structure when it's this. I'll show you some examples here as well. Still a bit buggy. This is a simple bridge. And here you can select the fourth as well. And you can see how the moments look when you move the fourth here on the beam and bridge like this. So there is no calculation step here, it's always calculated. And you can also do more. Complicated example. So this is a you can we did that in architecture in Shalmers where we we did that this is a, it's a struct course in in uh, see we'd like to have a mouse for this. Bit. So this is a high rise building where they have to reinforce it in different ways to make it more stable. Um, Calculate here. You can see structure deflecting. And you can see the moments here as well. But you can, of course, also apply or interactive force here as well. No, sorry. So 
seems to crash there. Do you want to borrow a mouse? Uh, yeah, we have some. <laughs> I'm not sure if it's a... Thank you. Yeah. Uh, no, I can't because then I will break the video connection. Oh. Uh -huh. <laughs> I only have one USB. Uh -huh. But I think there's a problem with the pro. But basically, if you can, uh, I will try another one. Of this As so I haven't run this application on this computer, so that's a bit. Uh, let's see here. Selection. Here you can see a, a larger building here where you can interact with it. And I can show, um, for example, normal forces. Through the structure. So that is objective frame. I also have a application with force path. So this is like a paint application for, for uh, stiffness. So you have this uh, area here where you can paint. So you have your normal drawing tools here. You have pencil, you have rectangle shapes you can fill. So here I, I can, for example, I can draw a rectangle shaped thing like this. And I can, so this is the, um, sketch mode, then I can move to physics mode. Here I uh, assign my boundary conditions. So I want it to be uh, fix it like this. And then I fix it here. So these, these boundary condition symbols, they work like a roller here. So you have a roller here and it can move like this. You can have this, it can move like this. So now I fixed it in both directions. So it can't move there. And then I can add a load in the middle like this. I can rotate it around. And then I go into physics mode or action mode where you can see the, the forces. And here you can select, for example, only tension, only compression or both. And I can also change like in pair view, how many forces you want to see at the same time. Control the transparency. Also scaling the size here. But what I can also, also can do is I can just grab this force here, rotate it, and you can see how the, the stresses changes when I rotate the force. I can also move the force around to see what happens if I move the force in different locations. I can look at the stress uh, from these stresses here when you move it around. Uh, you can change the color scale here as well to, to show it a bit better. And there's another <coughs> interesting uh, thing in this program as well. I'll just move this here, like this. This program also has a optimization mode. So if I want to make the optimal structure from this block, and this uh, load case, I can press this button here and it can do optimize the structure as well. So then it removes material and only keeps the one that actually the necessary parts of the structure. So now I get the pure uh, compression structure. Uh, if I change the boundary conditions here, so 
So let's add. So you can move freely in that direction. We go back to the structure here. Now you see you have a tension here below. If I do optimize structure here again, you can see it adds a second bar in the button to hold it together. You can also change here how much volume you want to allow it to use. So this is these are the two programs I want to show you to how you can work more interactively with programs. So in your case, many of your computational steps can always be done immediately. So don't think about how you can implement this without having a execute button on the top doing the background. Now I don't think you should change the program now in that stage, but this if if you uh, start developing your own fine element codes or you work with developers. Uh, you can have this source. Can't you do this in the background? 